Good morning. It has been super de duper crazy this morning, and I have had a gazillion meetings, and I am just now getting to your lecture at 1030. So I apologize for this being so late, um, but we do need to move on. I have some positive news for you. Um, we are not going to be able to test this Friday. I know that makes you really sad. So our test will be on Tuesday. That'll be our last test on Tuesday. Um, and then that gives us Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to, to do the last little bit, World War II, Cold War. We'll get that knocked out. Um, and then also I sent uh, an email to both you just now and your parents about s this Sunday, a practice AP exam. And I know no one wants to come on Sunday. I know it's not. Um, that's your one day off. I get it. But just this one time. Uh, to take the practice test. And I think it is so important for you to sit down from beginning to end. And I, as I said in the email, you can leave at any time. Um, some, some students like to do the multiple choice and the short answer, and then just like to look at and plan the DBQ and the LEQs. I just think it's so important. And we, it's something that we don't get to practice. So please really think about it. It's one o'clock on Sunday. You can bring your food, you can bring your lunch, you can bring a drink. Um, we'll all be in here. So uh, let me know. All right, so we're ready to begin the Russian Revolution. And when we look at the Ref Russian Revolution, we're gonna go back track a little bit, not much again, because we don't have a lot of time, um, and look at what leads us to the Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution is really the French Revolution uh, almost a hundred years later. Um, that is a really common compare and contrast French Revolution and Russian Revolution. They're almost a hundred years apart. Uh, they're for very much the same reasons that uh, they're, the monarch is unresponsive to the needs of the people. The country is bankrupt. It can't feed its people. It can't support its people. It, the government's not representative of the people. And in that way, they're the same. In other ways, whew, they're completely different. So um, we look at the Russian Revolution as starting with just a review. Uh, Tsar Alexander I from 1815 to 1853. Um, he was an enlightened despot at the beginning, but he kind of turned it back around. Uh, Alexander, after Napoleon's defeat, is going to go increasingly reactionary, which it's never good for a government to be just reactionary. Like we're always reacting to things. We don't have policies. We don't have plans. And that's never a good idea. He's the one, if you remember, that proposes the Holy Alliance back in the Vienna conference, like, hey, let's just all act like, act like nice people and get along. Uh, and obviously, we know that that doesn't work very well. So um, the Decemberist uprising in 1825, remember the Decemberist are young Russian officers. That gets squashed very quickly. This is the this 1925, that's in our rise of nationalistic, our revolutions of 1848, when everybody's uh, doing all this uprising, this liberal nationalistic kind of thing. And remember, they all get squashed. So that gets squashed. Um, and then um, on the next page, we have Nicholas I. And again, Nicholas becomes Europe's most reactionary monarch. Again, he's just continuing to rely on putting out fires, no real good policy plans, believed in divine right of kings, sought to prevent Western ideas from penetrating Russia. That you need to know. Nicholas I is going to do more to damage Russia and lead it into the Russian Revolution than anything else because he says no Western ideas. We don't want anything. Well, this is really when the Industrial Revolution is happening and you keep your country from industrializing and progress and moving forward, you're going to have difficulty. Um, Russia becomes a police state with censorship, secret police, uh, state-sponsored terrorism, uh, no representative assembly. There's no voice of the people anywhere in the government. Education is limited um, and uh, intellectuals develop into two opposing camps and you need to know that. The Slavophiles believe the culture over the Russian village is superior so that Slavophiles say we don't need anybody else, we're the best, we're the smartest. And then at the top of page three, Westernizers are the people that say, whoa, wait a second, we are so far behind everybody else, we need to catch up. Uh, and the biggest thing they do is seek to end serfdom. That's the one thing they want, like we don't want this serfdom. So 
Russia during the age of mass politics. So those chapters when we were talking about all the different groups of people that were advocating for uh, the right to vote and politics. What was Russia doing? They were being defeated in the Crimean War. Uh, it's a turning point fostering modernization. So for Russia, the Crimean War was a big wake up call. Like that was a bad move, keeping out everything Western. We don't have the same equipment they that your the other Europeans have. We don't have technology like they have. Um, the the Russian army was largely composed of under undereducated, unskilled serfs who performed for, poorly on the battlefield. Like we don't even know what we're doing here. So freeing the serfs now seemed necessary for the military and economic modernization. Again, always, 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 always the problem with Europe is on page three in the middle. Russia lacked a sizable middle class. There's no middle class. Uh, there's no one uh, to stimulate the economy by entrepreneurship. Uh, there's no liberalism to help move uh, the, the country in a forward progressive manner like instituting education and other reforms that will move a country forward. This is a key difference why Russia lagged behind Western and Central Europe uh, and the nobility had no reason to modernize, right? They would not because if we modernize, we lose our power. So they don't. And this will keep Russia lagging behind forever into the 21st century. Russia lags behind. They never have caught up and they never will catch up. Alexander II, perhaps the greatest reform-minded czar since Peter the Great, uh, more liberal, uh, the most liberal leader in Russian history. Uh, again, Russia is still very autocratic because they can't give up all that uh, power to the nobility. Alexander believes serfdom had retarded Russia's modernization. Yes, he's correct. Uh, agriculture had been poor for a century. 90% of Russian people worked in agriculture. And when you have 90% of your people working in agriculture to feed your country, something is really, really wrong. By 1881 in the United States, just a comparison, 10% of the population worked in agriculture. 10% fed all of the United States and a whole bunch of the world. So that number is very telling. Serfs could be bought or sold. Um, Nobles enjoyed an unlimited source of labor. So again, that's why nobles do not want to get rid of this um, um, policy of serfdom. So finally, the Emancipation Act in 1861 is going to abolish serfdom. Peasants no longer dependent on the Lord, free to move around, could enter into contracts. Land was given to serve, so they'll be given these mirrors where they're actually given land. Um, most Russians lived in communes. So part of the problem when you emancipate people is the condition in which you emancipate them. When you just say to a whole bunch of serfs, you're free without any kind of support, it is doomed for disaster. These people don't know how to read. They don't have skills. They know agriculture. That's it. They don't have money. They don't know how to read. They don't know how to write. They've never been given any kind of liberty whatsoever. And when you just say you're free, you've really set that up for failure. And that is what's going to happen. These serfs are free. They've overthrown the, the bondage of serfdom way up until the end of uh, the 19th century, but you've given them no support. And that will be very difficult. They're just going to move to cities. And when they get to cities, they don't have anything. Um, so uh, the uh, Zemestovov's Zem Zemestovs, I'm sorry, I can never say that word, established in 1864, district or villages assembling in, uh, administered in local areas, again, a significant step towards popular participation. But in reality, the lords, the nobility are going to take this over too. Uh, judicial reform is improved, uh, terms of military reduced from 25 years to six brutal corporal punishment was eased, censorship relaxed, education liberalized, and Again, we start an industrialization, and that's going to be stimulated by, like every other industrialization, the railroad. Russia had fallen behind. Russia needed better railroads, better armaments, organization. And so they'll start to build railroads, um, and they will build a sizable amount of railroad tracks. Railroads enable Russia to export grain and earn profits, stimulated domestic uh, manufacturing, strengthened Russia's military. Critics of Alexander II, again, late in his reign, that he became more conservative. Um, anarchists are going to try to blow him up. And yeah, they do. 
um, they eventually assassinate him in 1881. So then we get Alexander III, who says, I'm putting everything back the way it was. Russian Orthodox Church persecuted uh, other religious groups, encouraged anti-Semitism. They're going to be pogroms that are going to attack entire German villages, burn everything to the ground. This will be when we have a lot of immigration of Russian Jews into the United States. Uh, and then on uh, the next page, Count S.Y. Witt is going to oversee Russian industrialization and um, put Russia on the gold standard. By the 1900s, Russia will be fourth in steel production, so they are moving up um, um, slowly in this industrial uh, revolution, late, late comers. Um, despite economic and social reforms, Russia's economic problems were still profound. A third of all Russian farmland is not even used, like they're not even using it. They, they can't keep up with uh, uh, food production. So they're not using a third of their land. So that means they can't make enough food for their people to eat. People are going to starve in Russia. Uh, Russia has become the most populous nation in Europe. Depression of 1899 is going to wipe out anything that they had gained. 60% of the population illiterate. 60% of your population cannot read or write. Again, that's a terrible statistic. Um, and uh, Russia's plight is going to be aggrav aggravated by the Russo-Japanese War, in which they lose a war to Japan. So then we get Nicholas II, and he is the czar during the Russo Japanese War. Russians had established a sphere of influence in Manchuria, and now they want Korea. Japan says, nope, not going to happen. Russian fleet will be destroyed by Japan in 1904. Um, Russian losses will be heavy. They have to accept the Treaty of Portsmouth, which is a treaty that is facilitated, facilitated by uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Russia government now turned its attention away from the east and focused on the Balkans. So we kind of talked about that in World War I as we were leading up to World War I. Um, and then we have a revolution of 1905. Russia is going to have a series of attempts at revolution. And the problem is going to be, and this will be one of the major differences between the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. We're going to go back to that 60% illiterate. You cannot have a revolution and take over a government with 60% of your population illiterate. You have to have people to run things. And when you have 60% of your people illiterate and you have no middle class, if you win a revolution, what are you going to do after? That's a significant difference between the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. The French Revolution had that group of people. It had um, Robespierre and um, Marat and all those people that stepped up and took over the Estates General because they were educated. They were enlightened. Not so much here. So the liberals had gradually grown, gradually grown into certain segments over the previous 50 year. A professional middle class emerges due to increased educational opportunities. But the problem is there isn't enough of them. Um, Bloody Sunday, January 1905. And essentially the revolution of 1905 is really kind of just sort of one day, right? That's how much of a revolution they get. 1905, 20,000 workers and peasants march peacefully to the Winter Palace asking for reforms. The czar's not there. And so the army just says, we're going to kill all of you. And uh, fired on the marchers in cold blood, killing about 300, wounding an additional 1,000. And uh, a general strike is going to occur as a result of that. Peasant revolts, troop mutinies, paralyzed Russia by October. And Nicholas is forced to make some concessions. One of the largest concessions was the creation of a national parliament, the Duma. So the revolution of 1840. Night, I'm sorry, the revolution of 1905 gets Russia one thing, a parliament. It's called the Duma, some representative governments. One, serfs, could no longer, serfs no longer had to make payments. Uh, people in uh, Lithuania and Poland are allowed to speak their own language. They had to speak in Russian. Religious toleration allowed in Poland, meaning for Catholics and Jews. Uh, political trials were returned to regular courts some of the restrictions on Jews will be um, abolished. So then we have the October Manifesto in 1905 created by the Duma. Again, the Duma is like the Estates General Parliament Congress. That's just what they call their government. The Duma met for the first time in the spring of 1906. The majority are constitutional Democrats 
who were liberals. The Duma was a national assembly that could serve as an advisory body to the czar, an advisory body. Really, they have no power. Representatives elected by universal male suffrage granted freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of express, but please, please highlight the czar retained absolute veto, absolute. So whatever the Duma does, if it goes to the czar and the czar doesn't like it, he just says no, and it's done, it's over. Absolute veto power, absolute, like no backsies, like you can't do anything to overturn it. Um, and so, as you can well expect, a Nicholas eventually dissolves the Duma, like just go home, get out of here. Cadets sought to reduce the power of the czar. Liberals and middle class continued to urge reform. A third one is going to be formed in 1907 that was more conservative. Um, but really, repression was successfully used by the regime to weaken any political opponents or sympathetic people. Jews were once again savagely persecuted. Germans, Russians, Poles, their property will be attacked and often confiscated by the government. Almost a thousand alleged political opponents were executed. And Russia experiences, again, some economic recovery, but again, it's not going to be very successful. Um, we have a prime minister who pushed through important agrarian reforms, Peter uh, Stolfen. Uh, he's trying to break down the collective ownership and uh, land being put into private ownership. And anytime somebody is doing something good in Russia, they're going to get assassinated. So he's assassinated in 1911. Um, between 1911 and 1914, we have strikes. We have all these things. We have a poor showing in World War I. And as a result of all these things, we're going to get to socialism. All right, so we're stopping there. I don't really have an assignment for you to do today. Uh, I just really needed to get that background of Russia um, in the notes done today. So we kind of keep track of everything else. So have a great rest of your day. Let me know if you have any questions and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.